The fall of the Eldari was an incredible upheaval for the entire galaxy, what with the birth of a new Chaos God and the appearance of the Eye of Terror. But for the Eldari, its consequences ran far deeper. The race, already near annihilated by the god they created, was fragmented into smaller factions, each of whom took very different approaches to life, death, and avoiding Slaanesh post-fall. In order to hold their fall-inducing emotions in check, the Craftworld Eldari underwent perhaps the largest change of all, evidenced best by the paths they walk. The path of the warrior, however, is our focus today, specifically the individuals who embody and lead the aspect warriors walking it. I don't think I can do them all justice in a single log, there's too much to say, so settle in for what will probably be several parts of the updated tales of the most powerful fighters amongst the craft worlds and arguably Yanari today. This is the first part of the tale of the pseudo-immortal wanderers and founders of the Aspect Shrines, known simply as the Phoenix Lords. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. The story of the Phoenix Lords begins, as so many tales of the Eldari do, in late M30 with the birth of the Chaos God Slaanesh. Specifically, this tale begins on the planet of Ada Faeron, an urban world at the heart of the Eldari Empire. At the time of the fall of the Eldari, the warp rift known as the Eye of Terror appeared in said heart, causing the worlds within it to become what are known today as crone worlds and wiping out the vast majority of the populace to psychic backlash or demonic incursion. It was on Aid of Faeron, before the fall, that the first of what became the Phoenix Lords were born. Neither would rise to any prominence until the post-fall era, with one in particular acting as the undisputed leader, and we will explore them both later in this log. From there, the warrior order known as the Asur Yah would be founded, with most if not all future Phoenix Lords studying as part of the group, and it is from the Asur Yah that the Aspect Warriors would be founded amongst the Craftworld Eldari. Following the fall, the Craftworlders had instituted a system known as the Ayalethra, or Paths. These disciplines and studies formed a critical part of Craftworld society, as they were designed as a way for the Eldari to focus on a skill or craft rather than lax into excess and indulgence. Such attitudes taken to dark extremes had created Slaanesh to begin with, after all. Though there are many paths, too many to discuss here, the Aspect Warriors from the Asur Yah slotted into the Ayalethra as what is known as the Path of the Warrior. Any Eldari who walks the Path of the Warrior is trained as an Aspect Warrior, selecting one particular Aspect Shrine depending on their preferences and availability, I assume. The Aspect Warriors are the elite of any craft world military force, with each fulfilling a very specific combat role to embody a different facet of Kayla Mensha Kane, the Eldari War God. The role of Aspect Warrior is not for life, however. Once they've mastered the skills and have been sufficiently trained, the Eldari can leave the path of the Warrior at any time to pursue a new path and skill. But some Aspect Warriors do remain within their shrines for the rest of their days, unable to find a way to leave their path or join another. Said individuals are said to be lost on the path of the Warrior, in that they can never come back from it, and they are known as Exarchs. Rather than this being a sign of shame or insanity, the role of an Exarch is in many ways a vital and honoured one. Exarchs act as permanent warders for their aspect shrines, as well as training any who come to walk the path of the warrior and join their shrine in future. They also lead squads of aspect warriors into battle when required. As veterans of warfare and masters of their craft, they make the already elite aspect warriors even more dangerous. The Phoenix Lords, one could therefore say, were the first and greatest exarchs of their respective aspect, but unlike their successors and peers, they do not remain on their native craft world or home throughout their lives. Instead, the Phoenix Lords are nomads, though not necessarily to the same degree as each other. They travel the galaxy using the labyrinth dimension known as the Webway, visiting worlds and craft worlds either to assist with a war, establish a new shrine, or maybe just because they feel like it. 
It is said that the lords are drawn by intuition towards conflict and places of power, meaning that one or more of them can often be found fighting alongside craft wielders and more recently the Yanari when things get dire. This wandering has caused the spread of the Aspect Warriors from a single world and the original Aser Yah to almost every craft world in the galaxy. Not every craft world contains every shrine, but almost all of them contain at least a few. However, there may be some amongst you curious as to how the Phoenix Lords have managed to survive through 11,000 presumably very frequently fought years in an incredibly dangerous galaxy. And the answer is, well, they haven't. Sort of. The Phoenix Lords have actually died more times than I think anyone save them knows on battlefields the galaxy over. So how is it that they're still around, with their original personalities and souls no less? Well, as it happens, the Phoenix Lords do not take that moniker lightly, as they are able to resurrect or reincarnate after a fashion. As many of you will know, all Eldari from the craft worlds carry what are known as spirit stones, which store the wearer's soul on death as a way of safeguarding it from being consumed by Slanesh. The Phoenix Lords are no different, but their spirit stone forms part of their armour rather than being worn separately. This means that any who happen to put on the armour of a Phoenix Lord will usually store their own soul in the armour's stone alongside all the others to don the armour. This probably means that the spirit stone is also rather large and powerful to store as many souls as it does, but it also means the armour can never be taken off to ensure safety from Slanesh. However, the souls and personalities of the original Aser Yah are incredibly powerful and dominant even compared to another Exarch, and so those who take up a Phoenix Lord's mantle will become the Phoenix Lord, their mind and personality supplanted by the original. This is how the Phoenix Lords have survived for so long. When they die, one of their aspect warriors, presumably an Exarch, will seek out and locate their armour. The Aspect Warrior will then put the armour on and become possessed or mentally replaced by the Aser Yah, with their body becoming the new vessel for the Phoenix Lord, despite the external appearance, that being the actual armour, never changing at all. I assume there was a little bit of awkward adaptation early on to different bodies and whatnot, but the Phoenix Lords have probably done it enough times to learn very fast how to handle a slightly different form without losing any efficiency in combat. Now that we know the Phoenix Lords a little better, let's return to the beginning of this slog and to the world of Ada Faron. I mentioned already that the planet was the birthplace of two Phoenix Lords, including the first of them all. The founder of the Asoya was born as Iliathin, a very bored and very sceptical individual from what we know of his life pre-fall. His brother Tethesis argued that the pair of them should join the Exodites, the Eldari who saw the fall coming and fled the Empire long before it happened. However, Iliathin didn't buy into the supposed prophecies of the Exodites, and so they stayed on aid of Phaeron. One can only wonder how history could have changed for the entire species based on that one decision. Tethethis would, of course, be proven right when Slanesh, known to the Eldari as She Who Thirst, was born but the pair were able to survive the collapse of the Empire and the invasion of their world by demons. In the end, however, Iliathin would be forced to kill his brother, as Tethesis was possessed by a demon of presumably Slanesh. The now distraught Iliathin, with no future in sight, found refuge in a temple that was able to ward demons away. It is believed that despite their consumption by Slanesh, the presence of the Elgari gods lingered just enough to keep the Neverborn from coming close. Iliathin remained in that temple for many years, eventually resolving to end his own life around a year post-fall, but his plan was interrupted almost at the last minute by a new arrival at the temple. This arrival, a near feral Eldari named Ferethil, was shunned by Iliathin, but he was somehow convinced or unwilling to carry out his plan after meeting her. Several years later, Ferethil found her way back to the temple, this time in flight from what were essentially Drakari. This time, however, Iliathin had changed his stance. He fought alongside Ferethil to repel the pursuers and finally introduced himself, but under a new title. A Sermon. 
The name means Hand of Asuryan in the Eldari tongue, referring to the head of the Eldari pantheon, also known as the Phoenix King. Not only had a sermon taken on a new name, but a new outlook too. Rather than push for the away, he took her in as a disciple and trained her. The pair were able to recruit more followers on Ada Faron and beyond before settling a new home on a barren world they christened Asur. It was here that Asurman trained the Asur Ya and essentially created the other Phoenix Lords, as well as founding the very first Aspect Shrine before the group disbanded to ply the stars alone. From there, Asurman's tale is patchy. It's believed he's visited more craft worlds and created more aspect shrines than any other, which explains why the worries of his particular shrine are the most numerous across the species. These aspect warriors are known as Dire Avengers, a tactically flexible mid-range combat unit that can serve a multiple of combat and non-combat roles. Though only their exarchs are even remotely specialised in melee like a sermon is, the Dire Avengers represent Kayla Menchikane's nobility, yet also his mercilessness as a warrior, able to fight in a number of ways depending on need. A sermon exempted, Yvrain's guardian the Vizarch is undoubtedly the most famous Dire Avenger, an exarch who actually left his shrine to follow the Yanari's want-to-be leader into Komara. The weaponry of the Dire Avengers and their exarchs mirrors the Phoenix Lord in many ways, but with some differences. A sermon wields a blade known as the Sword of Asur, a weapon that contains the soul of none other than his brother Tethesis. The sword is in many ways similar to what humans would call a power sword, but with a twist. The soul in the sword is not entirely benevolent nor silent, and can attempt to attack the mind of any struck by the blade. Should Tethesis be successful, the victim will be slain instantly, making a sermon even more dangerous than he already is with his prodigious combat skill. The Dire Avengers created imitators or versions of the Sword of Asur, which are known as Dire Swords. They're not as powerful by any stretch, but each contains a filled spirit stone that allows for the mind break instant kill trick. At range, the Aspect Warriors use what are known as Avenger Shuriken Catapults, modified versions of the standard rifle wielded by Craftworld Infantry. Whilst a sermon doesn't actually carry a rifle like his descendants, his warsuit does contain shuriken catapults built into the wrist components or van braces. This gives a sermon the same flexibility his Dire Avengers are known for, but it hasn't been enough to keep him alive throughout the millennia. The patchy nature of his story means we have no clue how many times he's died, but I'd wager that it's at least a three-figure amount by now, just because of the hostility of the galaxy, the amount of times the Phoenix Lords fight, and just how old they are. More recently, however, his heretofore undisputed leadership of the Phoenix Lords appears to at least be somewhat in question. We'll get into full details in a moment, but with the rise of the Inari, it seems as though the apprentice from Ada Faron may have surpassed her master in some ways when it comes to the Asa Ya. The first of a sermon students was the only one to have met him as Ilya Thin, Ferethil, the young Eldari who found him in his temple. Ferethil was a young gladiator at the time of the fall, having been abandoned by her parents soon after her birth and fighting in the arenas ever since. She fled from her master a year after the fall, finding but being turned away by Ilya Thin a few days later. How she survived on Ada Faron is unknown in the intervening years, presumably thanks to her prodigious fighting skill from the arena, but she returned to her former home eventually to scavenge and steal supplies. Forced to flee following her discovery, she found her way back to Ilya Thin in his temple. This time, the pair would stand together and the rechristened a sermon helped Ferethel slay her pursuers. Though she kept her history from a sermon, she would study under him and became the first of the Asur Ya. Whether any training took place before they left Ida Faron and arrived on Asur is a little less clear, but I assume that she did. However, a sermon bestowed upon her a new name, Jane Zar, the Storm of Silence, perhaps a reference to the reckless and almost feral rage that she fought with and that he helped to temper for her own safety. It was actually Jane Zar who provided the means for the pair to depart Ada Faron, after a fashion at least, as the pleasure barge owned by her now former master became their way out. 
Just like the other Phoenix Lords, Jane Zar became an even more lethal warrior under the tutelage of a sermon, becoming an expert in melee combat, striking with swiftness and fury. She would found an aspect shrine as well on a sir, known as the Howling Banshees. This order of warriors are much like Jane Zar herself, lightning fast close combat fighters bottled on the banshee aspect of Cain granted by the crone goddess Morai Heg. Though they are rightly feared for their prowess in melee, it is the helms of the Howling Banshees that are perhaps most renowned. The name doesn't come from anywhere after all. The Banshee Mask, as it is known, acts as a psychosonic amplifier that turns a war cry into a paralyzing weapon, allowing the already dangerous Banshees to transform into nigh unstoppable forces that cannot be hit. Though Jane Zar wears the first ever Banshee Mask made, one that is much more powerful than its derivatives and imitators, she likely almost never seems to need it. The Storm of Silence is a seriously dangerous opponent for even the most skilled fighters. Not immortal, obviously, she's died, but more than a bit difficult to beat. In battle, she wields an ancient sword that predates the fall of the Eldari by millennia, known as the Blade of Destruction and she can wield her warp-tempered Triskelet known as Janus Moor, both in melee and as a self-returning projectile that is sharper than any weapon forged purely from mortal hands. It is known that second only to a sermon, Jane Zar is one of the most active Phoenix Lords in founding new shrines and visiting existing ones. The Dire Avengers are the most numerous aspect warriors, but the Banshees I wager are not far behind. We also know more of Jane Zar's activities, especially more recently, as I hinted at earlier. She joined up with a force of Craftward Althway, leading their aspect warriors into combat with a warband for the Night Lord's Traitor Legion. The Seers of Althway had foreseen the unity of the former Eighth Legion under the leadership of Talos Valkoran, a prophetic Astartes known as Soul Hunter that had slain his Primarch's assassin, Umshen. The Eldari orbit annihilated Valkoran's forces in their assault, with the Soul Hunter being slain as they had hoped during a duel with Jane Zar herself, but the canny and or desperate use of a grenade allowed Talos to take the Storm of Silence out with him. As always for a Phoenix Lord, she was resurrected following this death, but the next time she's documented as appearing would come in the event known as the Fracture of Bieltan in the era of the Gathering Storm. In fact, a sermon and the other accounted for Phoenix Lords were all with Jane Zar at this time, arriving just in time to prevent the Yanari from being wiped out in a webway ambush by the Thousand Sons Traitor Astartes. What made this especially interesting was the allegiance and leadership of the Phoenix Lords, which seemed to have passed from a sermon to Jane Zar. It is said that the Storm of Silence led the Asayat against the Sons of Magnus rather than the Hand of Asayan. Exactly what happened or how this happened or why this happened, I don't know. There are no records of a Phoenix Lord's conclave or ceremony that transferred command to Jane Zar, and it may have just been a one-off. But if I were to hazard a guess, then I would place the responsibility for it, if it did happen permanently, at the metaphorical feet of a certain deity. The Phoenix Lords that arrived in the webway to aid the Inari were believed to have pledged themselves to Iniad. Certainly Jane Zar has, and she acts as the most vocal of the Asoya in supporting the Inari. She's also fought alongside them on multiple occasions, most notably during the events known as the Psychic Awakening. Jane Zar appeared to defend Ivrain from assassination in this period not once, but twice the first being against the Incubus Drazhar, who may or may not be a Phoenix Lord himself, as we discussed in a recent log. The Master of Blades actually had the number of the Storm of Silence, who required the powers of Iniad to keep her boosted and in the fight, but she did enough to allow Ivrain to escape from a raid on Craftworld Saim Han. The second assassin was the Keeper of Secrets Shilaxi Hellbane, a glamour of whom appeared on the maiden world of Iathglas during a conclave of all Eldari factions to address the threat of chaos. This time, Jane Zar did not fight alone, as Iniad's Triumvirate joined the fray alongside Lelith Hesperax and a Solitaire to banish Hellbane. The Phoenix Lord would also encounter Drazar and his forces twice more following the raid on Saim Han, with both sides claiming a victory of their own. 
Firstly, Drazhar slew Jain Zar outright in the realm of Aelendrak, home of the Mandrakes in Komara and cloaked in shadow. It took the intervention of Ivrain to bring her back to life, as there was no chance of a living Exarch being able to find the warsuit in such a place. The power of Inead resurrected a nearby Exarch that had fallen in battle so that Jane Zar could live again and escape. The Storm of Silence met Inead's emissary on the world of Xandros not long before Drazhar himself arrived. In the second Phoenix Lord related duel to take place on that craft world, the powered up Jane Zar was finally able to put the Master of Blades down. Well, for a while at least, since he also seems able to pull the Phoenix Lord resurrection trick. Jane Zar's current whereabouts are unknown, but it can be assumed she is either founding or visiting a shrine, pseudo preaching about Inead either through taking heads or yelling, or otherwise going around and beating people up on the name of the Inari. The final Phoenix Lord we shall cover today is known as Maugan Ra. There are many tales of the Phoenix Lords yet to tell, but trying to condense them into one log with the required detail would take an entire Tau Seer. The Eldari who would become known as Maugan Ra was not living on one of the core Empire worlds at the time of the fall, but instead lived aboard the fleeing craft world known as Altansar. Unfortunately, the gravitational pull of the newly formed and expanding Eye of Terror was too powerful for the craft world to escape, and over several centuries, Alton Sar became lost within the Eye, with Malgan Ra the only one to escape. How he came to find a sermon and Jane Zar, or make his way to a Sir, is lost to history, as is his identity and life before coming one of the Asaya. As with the other Phoenix Lords, I assume that Maugan Ra is a title or an epithet as opposed to his real name. It literally translates from Eldari to mean Harvester of Souls, and if you think that sounds rather grim compared to other titles, then you're well on your way to understanding Maugan Ra. Whilst he's never betrayed or fallen from the ranks of the Asur, yeah, we'll tell that tale another time, the version of the Path of the Warrior extolled by Margan Ra is very different to his peers and is altogether more sinister. Margan Ra believes in the precise application of overwhelming, perhaps even outlandish power, and the aspect he founded the Dark Reapers shows this very clearly. Their Reaper launches fire hails of armor-piercing rockets capable of destroying even armored targets, but their advanced armor allows them to be far more precise than the heavy weapon troops of other races. A suite of stabilizers and rangefinders complement the additional protection of a Dark Reaper's armor, whilst the suit also allows the Aspect Warrior to psychically see down the barrel of their launcher to further increase accuracy. This comes at a cost of mobility for the Dark Reapers, but it doesn't really matter. With the right cover and their abilities, a small group of Dark Reapers are exceptional support for a craft world's army that often relies on movement and battlefield control. Embodying Kane's aspect of the Destroyer, the Dark Reapers live up to their aspect, personified best of all by their Phoenix Lord. Unlike his fellow Asur Yah, who often wield ancient weapons on which their Aspects weapons will be based, Maugan Ra set out to craft something unique for himself. He sought to create a weapon that could allow his precise power to be practiced in both ranged combat and in melee, and undertook what you might call a quest to fashion it. I will spare you the full details of his journey that involved crone worlds, hordes of demons, sacrificed exarchs, and more, but eventually the task was completed. So was created the Maugatar, a fusion of the Shrieker Cannon of the Harlequin Deathchesters and an Executioner Power Glaive typically wielded by Howling Banshee Exarchs. It is truly unique, and since Maugan Ra crippled the Bone Singer who made it, it will always be unique. Whilst Maugan Ra's activities are not exactly well documented, there are a few battles he's been known to take part in. We lack a date for the Battle of Stormwald in Segment and Tempestus, where the Harvester of Souls is said to have stood alone and defeated an entire swarm of Tyranids from High Fleet Leviathan. We also cannot date his appearance at the Siege of Craftworld Ale Tok. He actually joined two other Phoenix Lords in helping to hold back a deceived and vengeful Imperium from crippling Ale Tok beyond repair. 
His role is actually unknown in the matter. Presumably he was leading a contingent of Dark Reapers to cut through Astartes leading the assault. But I don't doubt that three Phoenix Lords played a very big part in keeping Alatox standing. However, despite his presumed numerous deaths, Maugen Ra never forgot where he came from. Altansar was still out there, somewhere, ensnared within the Eye of Terror. When Abaddon the Despoiler launched his 13th Black Crusade, he left a warp rift in his wake, and Maugen Ra seized the opportunity to go hunting. He travelled into the Eye using soul fire like breadcrumbs to find his way out, seeking whatever would remain of Altansar. And he found it somehow still intact and with survivors on board. Heavy fighting ensued as the Phoenix Lord led his lost home back to reality, but they made it out. Despite the fact that the entire race of Eldari view Altansar with suspicion and hostility due to their extended time in the eye and the presumed corruption that came with it, it would be hard to argue that this operation was anything other than a great success for the Harvester of Souls. More recently, Altansar have aligned themselves fully with Ivrain and Iniad, which might explain why Maugun Ra at least is aligned with them as well, and maybe is why he, Jainzar and others were able to swing the entire Asurya if they didn't all decide to support it. Since his appearance in the webway alongside the other Phoenix Lords, we've been unable to track what Maugun Ra has been up to. I'd wager it's a combination of founding Dark Reaper Shrines, helping out Yvrain, and harvesting souls for the heck of it. As I already mentioned, there is too much to say on the Phoenix Lords to contain within a single log. I tried once long ago, and all the detail was sacrificed on that particular altar. So we're going to, for the first time since I properly started these logs, split the story into multiple parts. Hopefully I'll be able to get the rest into a second part without needing a third, but I make no promises at this time. Despite not covering the whole story just yet, I hope you can see from the tale so far just how powerful the Asurya are and how fundamental a role they played in shaping modern Eldari society. Whether a Sermon and co founded the Path of the Warrior or not, or just jumped on the bandwagon, it belongs now to the Aspect Warriors entirely. The Path and the Aspects are one and the same. We'll pick up the story next time, looking at the other major Phoenix Lords as well as the less known or mysterious ones, and whilst we're there we'll also try to weave in the original tale of the Eldari's end before the coming of Ivrain. For now though, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.